Okay, we can see the uh, attendees are, are growing and plateauing a, a little bit. Um, so I think it's nearly time that we, we get going. And um, I'd like to thank you very much for giving up your time on this, uh, this relatively sunny evening in Swansea, a rarity. Um, my name is Richard Bracken. I'm a professor in exercise physiology at Swansea University. And this evening or this morning, uh, depending on the part of the globe that you're currently in, myself and colleagues are going to present a short webinar to you uh, right from Swansea Liberty Stadium. Um, we're very interested in football. Um, and as you'll discover, we're very interested in type 1 diabetes. And over the next 40 to 45 minutes, we're going to chat to Jordan Morris, a professional either football or soccer player, depending on which side of the Atlantic you are, uh, who has the condition of type 1 diabetes. Now, this seems particularly relevant to us as we're currently in a fever grip in Europe of the Euros 2020. And of course, Summer Olympics are beginning uh, in another month. So that combined with uh, 2020 being a postponed 100 year of the formation of Swansea University, um, sponsors of Swansea City FC, and also that 2021 is the 100th year of the discovery of insulin. This is a medication that is absolutely instrumental in improving the lives of people uh, with diabetes. So we're very interested in how sports people can manage the worlds of elite athleticism and also to manage their diabetes and perform at the best of their ability. Um, and we're very interested to hear from Jordan this evening about how people with type 1 diabetes can help others to become more educated, to be inspired and to empower other people uh, to strive for better. So we're delighted to introduce Jordan. Jordan's currently based in Seattle to talk about his sporting life, his type 1 diabetes and how he's managed the demands of both on the world stage as a pro footballer and also in fulfilling his dream to also play in European football leagues by coming to Swansea ever so recently. So welcome, Jordan. Um, I hope we didn't get you out of bed uh, too early for this because you're based in Seattle and there's a bit of a time lag on that. Uh, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good, definitely not, <clears throat> definitely not too early. I'm uh, excited to be here, excited to talk about um, my story with type one and yeah, just really looking forward to it. Fantastic. And just before we get going, Jordan, um, for the attendees that are here, uh, there is a Q&A function on the Zoom. Uh, so if you have a question and you'd like to ask Jordan later, uh, hopefully we can stagger that throughout the course of the webinar. Um, now, please recognize we can't give individualized uh, uh, diabetes advice uh, or healthcare advice that really should come from your healthcare provider. So please, if you can, uh, if you're thinking about engaging in new or unfamiliar uh, physical activity, to have that conversation with them. I'd like to introduce you to uh, all of the rest of the attendees here. We have Molly. Uh, if you want to give a wave, Molly. Molly Smallman, a master's research student at Swansea. Uh, Jason Pitt, a PhD student at Swansea University. And also to Dr. Olivia McCarthy. Um, who is here not only to uh, ask some questions later on to Jordan, but also by means of an overview to be able to set the scene for people who may not be fully aware of the condition of type 1 diabetes. Uh, so over to you, Olivia, uh, to maybe spend just a couple of minutes describing the condition of type 1 diabetes and its interaction with exercise. Lovely. Thank you very much and um, good evening to all. As Richard said, I'm Olivia and I'm a postdoctoral researcher in exercise physiology at Swansea University. And over the next few slides, I'm just going to hopefully give um, a brief overview of type 1 diabetes and exercise before handing back over to uh, Jordan and Richard. So a fundamental place to start, I guess, is by ans ans answering the question, what is type 1 diabetes? And it's an autoimmune condition in which the pancreas secretes little to no insulin. Now, insulin is an essential hormone produced by the beta cells within the pancreas that allows the glucose from our blood to enter our cells and fuel our bodies. You can think of it much like a key. In type 1 diabetes, the body attacks the cells responsible for producing insulin, resulting in blood glucose levels being too high in the bloodstream. 
The exact mechanism causing type 1 is currently unknown, but it's through no fault of the person it does affect. The peak age for diagnosis is between 9 and 14 years, but diagnosis as a younger child or indeed adult is also possible. Type 1 diabetes currently affects around 400,000 people in the UK, 30,000 of whom are children. Though there's not currently a cure, researchers are continually developing and testing new treatments. The sign Signs for type 1 diabetes follow the four T's. Going to the toilet or needing to urinate a lot, being extremely thirsty with an inability to quench the thirst, feeling more tired or lethargic than usual, and looking thinner or losing weight. So type 1 is currently treated um, by a reliance on insulin replacement therapy, and that is typically administered through two routes as multiple daily injections, which involves the person administering insulin into the body using an insulin pen, or by insulin pump therapy, which involves wearing a small device in which the um, system provides a steady stream of insulin into the body. In addition to insulin replacement therapy, people with type 1 diabetes also need to regularly check their blood glucose levels. And this can be done using a small implantable sensor that is placed underneath the skin, the sensor then sends information to the monitor and people can check their glucose at any time throughout the day. This has reduced the need for people to perform as many blood glucose measurements throughout the day, which can often be uncomfortable. Nevertheless, there are certain circumstances when blood glucose measurements are needed, particularly around exercise. Throughout their lifetime, a person with type 1 diabetes can inject as many as 65,000 injections and measure their blood over 80,000 times. In addition to these conventional therapy treatments, lifestyle modifications like eating a balanced healthy diet, managing stress and getting regular physical ex exercise are considered important components in the management of diabetes. Indeed, physical activity is considered a cornerstone in the management plan and is encouraged by many leading diabetes specific health organizations. It has very many positive health benefits for people with type 1 diabetes that can ultimately improve their quality of life and reduce the risk of complications. However, exercise can be challenging because it does cause disturbances in blood glucose. And though different exercises affect the body differently, endurance-based activities like walking, jogging or cycling tend to reduce blood glucose levels and hypoglycemia is often a concern. Conversely, higher intensity activities like strength training or sprinting can raise blood glucose concentrations and hyperglycemia is sometimes a concern. For mixed activities like football, blood glucose responses may be less variable, but this can really depend on the nature of the game, as I'm sure Jordan will tell us about later. In order to exercise as safely as possible, there are just some precautions people with type 1 diabetes may sometimes need to take. Though largely dependent on the type of exercise they're doing, as well as some additional factors, three major current glycemic strategies include reducing or altering the timing and amount of insulin they inject, modifying their nutritional intake, and keeping track of their glucose levels leading into and throughout the exercise. Though it may present as a challenge, exercise is certainly not impossible for people with type 1 diabetes, and we can take great inspiration from professional athletes like Jordan and others who achieve the highest possible sporting success within their chosen exercising sport. Thank you very much, and I'd also like to just say a massive thank you to everyone at Swansea University and Swansea City FC for working behind the scenes for making tonight's uh, webinar possible, as well as to everyone at home for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you for that, Olivia, and that certainly sets the tone a, a little bit. And um, Jordan, maybe if we could start off just a little bit uh, about the, the very diagnosis of your type 1 diabetes. Um, I wonder if you could fill us in a little bit about your early childhood and the situation that led to you being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Yeah, definitely. Um... So I was nine when I was diagnosed. Um, I was having all those symptoms uh, that were presented and um, going, to the, <clears throat> going to the bathroom a lot, feeling incredibly thirsty. Um, I lost weight and um, yeah, I was having 
episodes where I didn't feel very good, which I'd find out later were higher or low blood sugars. And um, fortunately, I was I was really lucky. My my mom is a nurse and my dad's a doctor, so uh, my mom actually recognized all the symptoms um, as she had dealt with you know type ones and in the past. So she recognized the symptoms pretty early, um, which I was fortunate uh, for because obviously the longer it goes on, things can um, be a little bit tough. So so I remember it was actually the day after Christmas here, um, I was about to go play in a, play in a little soccer tournament. And, uh, my mom, she, she knew that, that I had it, but she's like, Oh, we're just going to go do a, a routine, uh, check in with the doctor. Um, and, uh, he told me that I, uh, I had type one. So, um, it was all kind of a blur. I had no idea what it was at the time. Um, and so, uh, it obviously took a lot of uh, you know, practice and, and research at, at a young age, which can be difficult. But again, I was super fortunate to have two parents that were that were really instrumental and helpful and um, kind of helped me manage. And they still do, honestly. So, and, and did you feel that you were becoming, as a function of the diagnosis of your condition, part of a community of people with type 1 diabetes as well? Yeah, 100%. I think the, the, the diabetes community is uh, a very tight one and, and you get to meet a lot of amazing people. And, and, you know, I was here in Seattle when I was diagnosed. So different organizations like JDRF or um, things like that are, are, are awesome in the sense that you get to meet, you know, other kids living with it. Um, people, you know, adults that have lived with it for a long time, get to talk to, to, uh, to people. They have this massive fundraiser that they do every year that I remember going to as a kid. Um, and uh, just events like that, that um, you definitely feel like you're, you're part of a, a community. And I think it's helpful when you're able to, to speak with, with others who are going through the same thing. Sure. I, and I'm, I'm curious about, you know, were you a very physically active child? You know, was there concerns on that initial diagnosis that, you know, you were running yourself into problems? That, that phase of your life where you don't maybe fully understand the implications of going out to exercise and the concerns that you might have had, sorry, your parents might have had that you weren't fully aware of. Yeah, so uh, a few parts of that question. I think um, I was a you know a super physically active kid. I, I knew I wanted to to be a professional athlete. I played a lot of sports as a kid: uh, baseball, basketball, soccer. I was obsessed with. Uh, with being, being active. And so, um, I remember my mom told me that the first, uh, the first question she asked the doctor after I left the room, um, when I was diagnosed, my dad took me out to the waiting room and, and, uh, my mom, uh, asked the doctor, can, can he still play sports? Cause that's really the only thing that, that I wanted to do. And, and I remember she told me that he said the the more, the better. So I think that I kind of took that and ran with it and was like okay as long as I can keep doing what I love to do things are going to be okay and obviously as a nine-year-old um I didn't understand all the implications of exercising with diabetes and my dad actually just recently told me obviously he you know has had complete faith in me but he told me you know I was worried that you weren't even going to be able to maybe play at at the college level uh let alone the, the professional level um just with you know, he, he didn't know how things were, were going to go, especially being diagnosed at a young age. Um, so he told me that recently. I was like, wow, I guess I didn't really realize how um, how much this this can can impact uh, can impact exercise when when you're when I was nine years old. But, but fortunately, you know, I was able to, to push through that and was able to accomplish. It sounds like you have a very strong relationship between the healthcare providers, the parents, yourself. And that encouragement to be physically active or to at least allow for a safety net to allow you to be that physically active. Uh, would that be fair to say that the healthcare professionals took on board the need for you to be that physically active and try to, to encourage that? Yeah, for sure. And I think it, like I said, I wouldn't be where I am without my family, my, my friends, the support of, of kind of the network that I have. And that, that includes, um, you know, the doctors and nurses and the healthcare professionals that help me out. I think diabetes can be isolating at times and frustrating. And so to have that support group um, and to have that network, I, I definitely wouldn't be um, at the level that I'm at without, without sure. them. 
And, yeah. and I guess, you know, the, the proof of the pudding here is um, that you have made it to be a professional footballer. And maybe just to, for those people who don't fully know that the history of your development from being a child with an interest to a professional footballer, wh where did that take you? What were the steps in the process that led to, uh, you know, where you are now? Yeah, um, so I grew up in Seattle um, and well, at around 14, I, I just, you know, I was playing a lot of sports, but decided soccer was, or football was my, was my favorite and um, went, went forward with that and, and knew that I wanted to become a professional someday. And um, my dad is actually the team doctor for, for the Sounders here in Seattle, the MLS team here in Seattle. So growing up, I was kind of had a, a little bit of a sneak peek into, into what it was like uh, to be a professional athlete through him. And then I, I played for the Sounders Academy team um, when I was 17, 18. Um, and then, you know, went off to college, played a few years there and then came back and signed for, for Seattle and, and played um, the first four or five years of my career here. Um, and then recently uh, went on loan uh, to Swansea and Obviously, unfortunately, had a, a, a knee injury when, when I was there and cut my time there really short. Um, and then I'm back in Seattle doing rehab now. Um, but yeah, so that, that's kind of my, my journey. I also have played for the national team, the, the U.S. national team, uh, since I was 19. Um, and that's been, been absolutely amazing. So, um, yeah, those are, that's kind of been my, my steps. Yeah, thank you for that, Jordan. Very revealing, I think, about um, how success can breed success as long as there's, you know, con continuous interest and motivation to, to excel. Um, we will talk about that injury later uh, in the session if we can. Um, but for now, we're going to head over to Jason and Olivia, who have been monitoring the questions that are coming in uh, from the attendees. And let's see what the audience are asking. Hi, John. It's a pleasure to uh, finally meet you. And thank you very much for coming on to this webinar with us. Uh, yeah, there are a couple of other people tuning in who probably also want to meet you, but for now, I've just put some questions up in our Q&A, so hopefully you're, you're happy to answer them as well. Yeah, no problem. Uh, the first one's coming from Matt, and he wants to know, do you know what your numbers are during the game, presumably your blood glucose uh, levels? And if you're wearing a CGM or flash, I think you mentioned you were wearing Dexcom, um, is there a good spot on the body that you use so that's protected uh, during the tackles and uh, for any running that you're doing? Yeah. Great question. So yeah, I wear a CGM. I wear a Dexcom. Um, I can, I wear it kind of on the back of my arm here. Um, and I haven't had too many issues, um, with it getting ripped off or anything like that. Uh, sometimes when it's hot, you know, you can sweat and, um, it, it can fall off, but I think that's only happened once, um, while I've been playing. Um, so this has been amazing. The technology that's come out has been incredible. Um, I'm too far away during the match for it to be constantly you know someone to be monitoring it i'm too far away from the monitor but um at halftime you know like it can kind of backlog the information so i can see where i was throughout the half um, but i don't necessarily have that real-time data uh during the game so it's kind of you know you go in at a certain num number that you want to go in at and then you you check at halftime and kind of readjust from there so so what numbers do you usually try and go in at or is it just sort of based on on how you feel at that time yeah, so I definitely have a, a set uh, number that I want to go in at. It's probably around 160, 150, 160 in that range. Um, as diabetics know, that's not <laughs> that's not always easy to do. Um, different factors can, can cause it to be um, higher or lower, but I, I try to go in at, at uh, around kind of 150, 160 range. All right, great. Thank you. Yeah. Brilliant. And um, there's just a question coming in from Noah, who wants to know, at what age did you start playing soccer or football for those who have UK based? Yeah, um, I started playing when, uh, before I can really remember, since I was a, you know, three or four um, growing up in, in Seattle in the backyard, kicking the ball around with my brother. My brother played, my older brother played, um, and I think I would have kind of followed him uh, into whatever sport he played. So I'm thankful that he, uh, he stuck with soccer. Brilliant. So you've you've played for the Sounders and you played for Swansea, but you've also done a lot of work for the US team, um, especially in one of the finals that you scored in. What does it compare playing in a national team versus playing in a in, in a club team? Yeah, it's 
just an unbelievable honor. You know, growing up as a kid, I remember watching the U.S. play and, and always wanting to, to, to play for, the, uh, you know, the national team someday and watching World Cups and things like that. But it, it's really indescribable when you put on the jersey for the first time and, you know, you're, you're listening to the national anthem and, and just knowing that you're representing your country is a, is a pretty amazing feeling. So it's, it's, um, it's just been an, an absolute honor. And, and every time I, I step on the field, I, I don't take it for granted because it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. Do you feel as though you, uh, with your teammates, that you get along well with uh, sort of all the teammates that you made in, in Seattle in the US? Um, and also sort of have you kept in touch with some of the ones in, in Swansea? Yeah, I'm, I've been super fortunate. My teammates um, throughout my career have been, been amazing and with the national team and with the Sounders, um, some of my best friends. And, and honestly, one of my favorite parts about Swansea in my short time that I was there were, were, the, were the guys and my, and my teammates. They were so welcoming and, and supportive. And um, anytime you go into a new environment, it's, it's difficult sometimes, um, but they, they made it really easy. And, and yeah, I've definitely been keeping in touch um, with some of the guys, they, they've been reaching out about um, my injury and um, you know, it's, it's an amazing club. So I was, I was fortunate to get to be a part of it for a bit. Uh, nice. Do, do your peers ever sort of, do you discuss your, your diabetes at all with your, with your teammates or your friends in life in general? And are they quite understanding or do they think of it as they're not, it's not something that they're not quite sure what it is and you have to explain something to them? I think at first it's definitely um, maybe that a little bit. Um, like when I was a kid growing up with, with my friends, um, I definitely had to explain it to them, especially as a young kid. Um, but now, you know, all my teammates and, um, and my friends now are super supportive. And, and kind of like I mentioned before to Richard, I think having that network of support um, is so important. And that includes your teammates and your friends and uh, just having other people to help you. Um, with, with managing your, your diabetes is, is, is really important. So um, that includes my friends and my teammates and um, everyone is, has been super supportive once you kind of explain what you're doing. Yeah, that's nice to hear. Nice to have a supportive network. Yeah, definitely. Lovely. We're going to leave the Q&A question open for the second draft in which um, Molly and I will open some questions, but hand back over now to you, um, Richard. Thank you. Um... Jason and Olivia, um, and I think we're just starting to touch on that, Jordan, with um, the life of a professional sports person and diabetes management. And I mean, I think everybody's always fascinated to find out what a professional athlete actually does with the spread of different types of training, the volumes of training you do, uh, the need for matches maybe once, twice a week. Um, it can be quite challenging. And I'm wondering if you might be able to reflect when you're in the full flight of training and, um, and playing, what that involves on a typical week. Yeah, it, in terms of diabetes or just in, in general? In training. In, in training, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, each, each week can be different, like you said, depending on how many, um, how many games uh, you have in that week. Um, in a typical week, you know, in, in the MLS, it's usually on the weekends you, you play. And so um, you'd have your game, maybe have a, a day off or a recovery session after the game. Um, and then a couple hard days of training and, and in the middle of the week. And then leading up to the game, you kind of um, do more tactical stuff, start uh, looking at the, the opponent that you're going to have on the weekend and, and start building towards the game. But the, the stress on the body kind of comes down as, as you get closer to the game. So um, you know, it's, it's, it's just dependent on, on, uh, how many games there are in a week. I know when I was over at Swansea, we have two games in a week. And so the training load would be a little bit different. Um, especially for the guys who are starting every game, um, you know, the day after the game, they might be doing a recovery session while the, the, the guys that didn't play were out on the field training, um, and, and getting ready. So, um, yeah, I think it's just, it's all dependent on the amount of games that you have. Um, and you kind of base your training, training load on that. And I think that that leads on to maybe a question you were sort of expecting is if, as Olivia alluded to in one of her earlier slides, blood glucose can change so dramatically in response to different forms of training, how on earth do you manage your glucose levels with such a variety of different training types and with a variety of match or training type sessions where maybe in a match situation, the stress 
of performance is a bit more than in the training sessions themselves. Yeah, so um, so I wear an insulin pump, um, and uh, I wear an Omnipod. So I'm actually able to wear it while I'm training and while I'm playing in games, which has been been amazing because I'm able to the my my basal rate that I have going, I'm able to to turn it down while I'm playing, obviously, but I'm still able to have a little bit in my system mm-hmm. um, while I'm playing because I noticed when I came to the Sounders. Um, the adrenaline of play, I mean, the Sounders have 45,000 fans at their game. The adrenaline playing in front of that um, number of people, my blood sugar was, was tending to, to spike up at, at the end of games, which is interesting. You'd think you'd be out there running around, you'd be coming down. Um, so once I got on this Omnipod, I was able to, to have a little bit of insulin still going into my system while I was playing, and it was helping me come off the field at a much, uh, much lower level. So I think playing with the with the basal rate a little bit depending on whether it's a game or a hard training or a you know kind of easier training is is something that i've done in the last few years since i've switched the omnipod and it's been been really helpful okay i mean that is really important information about this sort of potential for too much insulin to pull glucose down as well as in cases the exercise um and i guess the counter to that is the need for consuming, um, you know, sugar or carbohydrate uh, to help level off some of the um, lowering of blood sugars that might occur. And I'm just reflecting on the idea of a nine-year-old Jordan uh, actively being encouraged to consume sugar, whereas many, many adults, uh, parents with young children are always trying to wean kids away from too much sugar consumption. Um, but that that's a clear important element for diabetes management is making sure you have a quick resource to be able to remedy potentially falling blood glucose levels. Yeah, I remember growing up, uh, my friends were always a little bit jealous of me having my fruit snacks or my skills or whatever it was that I was, <laughs> I got to eat every once in a while to bring my my blood sugar up. But no, I, I carry a bag around me, uh, around with me at all times that has, um, you know, my supplies and, and some of those are I do uh, like fruit snacks as kind of my low blood sugar snack. Uh, so I have that on the sideline. Really, I, I go, it comes with me everywhere. Um, but I have it on the sideline during training and games. And, and um, if I ever need any uh, sort of a uh, bump in my blood sugar, that's um, kind of what I go to. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's really important uh, to have something always around as, as a diabetic. And, of course, this goes on top of the demands of professional football, where generally athletes consume a high carbohydrate diet anyway. So, you know, you must consume a lot of rich carbohydrate based foods for meals day in, day out, as well as the need to have a quick resource that you may need to remedy falling the glucose levels with and still maintain good glucose control. Yeah, so I think I've, I've kind of, um, a diet's obviously huge for whether you're a diabetic or not as a, as a professional athlete, diet is massive. And so um, you just have to be a little bit more focused as a diabetic on that diet to, to keep your blood sugar in the, in the right spot. And so I've kind of, on, it, it goes back to kind of, you have to read your, your week and read how difficult the trainings and how difficult the, the games are, because I really focus my high carbohydrate days on the on the days that are going to be kind of the hardest training which is maybe once a week and then the night before uh the game and the day of the game those are kind of my three days where i go um pretty heavy on on the on the carbohydrates and then the rest of the the days it's more um you know vegetables uh protein that kind of that kind of stuff and so i think to avoid having kind of high carbohydrate consumption every single day it's just um kind of reading the week a bit because it definitely is a little bit easier to, to control your blood sugar when you are um, maybe not having quite as many, quite as many carbs. Yeah. And do, do you seek the help of a nutritionist, a dietitian, or somebody with an interest of, of the sporting side of it, as well as the need to just manage blood glucose levels? Yeah. So um, actually when um, some of the, 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 training staff with the national team has been really uh, instrumental in, in kind of this diet that I've been, been using and um, because they obviously understand the, the sporting side of it as well, but, but have, have been really helpful with 
with working with me as a diabetic too. Um, and then with this, yeah, with the sounders, um, I, I speak with, with a, a nutritionist and, um, kind of work through any, any questions that I have and, um, things like that. But, but I think these, these trainers with the, with the national team, um, have been, have been really helpful. Excellent. Yeah. That's really good news. Now you, you mentioned some, some very clever technologies, the insulin pumps, uh, CGM, uh, continuous glucose monitoring devices. Have you seen a real change in the world of diabetes monitoring and technology around exercise in recent years with the advent of these more portable devices for managing blood glucose levels? Yeah, it's been unbelievable. Um, as I mentioned with the Omnipod, I think being able to wear that during a game or during training is been a complete game changer but for me the the one that's helped so much is is the continuous glucose monitor um and i wear a dexcom and before i'd have to you know poke my finger and check my blood sugar before a game um but i'd be kind of going into it blind in the sense that you don't have any idea if it's going up if it's going down whether it's staying level and i think that's the most difficult part and so what the cgm does is it'll give you your blood glucose reading but then it also tells you whether it's going up or down or staying level and so you really know where you're going to be heading in the next 45 minutes, which is, which is a half, you know, until you can recheck it at halftime. So that technology has been a, a huge uh, game changer because if I, if I'm at 150, but I'm going straight down, I'm, I'm going to be low in the next 20 minutes when I'm out on the field. So I know that I probably have to take something before heading out there, you know, some sugar. And so um, just knowing where you're trending, where you're heading has been, um, has been amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And I said I would, um, but I'm going to bring back that injury um, in your match with Huddersfield when you were playing for Swansea uh, back in February. Um, wondering if you could maybe bring that, you know, that, that sort of injury uh, discussion back a little bit. What was it? What has been the recovery and rehabilitation route that you're now going through? Where are you, do where are you now? How are you doing in terms of the stage of recovery? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one for sure. I, I first, I just want to say I was absolutely loving my time there, and and was so excited about the, the, uh, the new challenge and and just being being a part of that team. So so to have an injury happen, especially one of of this severity, so early on in my time over there was was pretty devastating. Um, it was an ACL injury. It was just one of those awkward falls that freak accidents that happen and um you know I kind of knew right away what it was as I was getting stretched off the field um my dad's uh he's actually an orthopedic surgeon he does ACL um surgeries and so I, I actually I called him from the from the locker room told him what happened and and you know we, we kind of both knew what was coming um so I had an MRI three days later and two days later I think and got the news and and um yeah, unfortunately had to, had to fly back home and, and I'm just doing my, my recovery, uh, in Seattle, but, but I'm, I miss it there a lot. Um, I was having so much fun and, and, and like I said, was just so excited to be part of a part of, part of that team. And, um, so it was, it was really devastating for, for myself and my family. And, but yeah, just back in Seattle now doing my rehab, I'm about three and a half months out, maybe a little more than that from surgery and, and things are, are moving along really well. It's just, uh, it's a long process, so. Indeed it is. Uh, okay, on that note, we're going to move over to um, Olivia and Molly uh, for a second audience Q&A uh, from some of the queries that have come in um, on what you've said so far, Jordan. Uh, hi, Jordan. So we've got a few really great questions coming in from the audience, actually. Um, so the first one, so how does your management of your glucose kind of differ during match day compared to training? Because I imagine... Training is more of a controlled environment, match day, completely unpredictable. And then just to add that as well, have you ever had to come off the pitch because you're having a hypo? Yeah, that's a great question. I think my you definitely have to be a little bit more diligent on game days because during training, if I have to step off to the side for a second to, to check my blood sugar, it's not a, not a huge deal. Um, but obviously that can't happen in a, in a game. And, and so... Um, you just have to be really, really diligent in, in counting your carbs and, and making sure you're giving yourself enough insulin and um, especially head, heading, into a, heading into a game. Um, but I think the fact that I'm able to 
you can almost have your monitor close enough during training where it can read while you're while you're playing so it's um it's a little bit easier to manage manage during training um and i've never had to come off fortunately um i definitely err a tiny bit more on the side of keeping it a little bit higher so um so my blood sugar doesn't drop too much during during games i remember one time i had to run to the sideline uh when i was playing for for the sounders and grab some some gummies i have a little um signal with my trainer where i tap my head and he gets uh gets the the, the fruit snacks ready and i ran ran over and, and grabbed some during a break and play but that's the only time i remember um having to do anything for a little blood sugar just on that note is there a um a lot of people have come through with questions on do you have a particular kind of pre-game or pre-training strategy with your food that you try to adopt in order to try and minimize that low occurring or indeed that high yeah definitely and this is something i talk about a lot and i think it's difficult because everyone is a type one is a little bit different and, and kind of react to foods a little bit differently but i always tell kids that i that i talk to that it's so important to, to get into a routine of what you eat before training and before games because you know then how those foods are are kind of going to affect you going into training going into the game and so i've really gotten into a routine of what I eat before my trainings and I kind of eat the same thing um, just so I don't go into a blind and then I do the same for for game day and obviously the foods are a little bit different for game day because you have to have some more carbs to have the, the energy to go out and 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 play 90 minutes but um, I think getting into that routine and finding what foods work for you is so important because um, then you're going in with a little bit more confident confidence that you know like where your blood sugar is going to be throughout training and throughout the game. Yeah, absolutely. And just a last um, question coming in from us. Actually, it's more of a statement. A lot of people have said that you're a great source of inspiration for either themselves or for um, children that they have who are finding it difficult to manage their glucose around an exercising environment. So is there, you know, you mentioned earlier, you've had great support either through, you know, your family or indeed your friends. Is there something that you would say to a young person who perhaps doesn't have that support around them um, to try and encourage them um, that exercise isn't always a barrier? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, I, I, what I always tell kids is that diabetes can't hold you back from accomplishing what you want to accomplish. And for me, that was playing professional soccer and, and it can be anything, um, whatever your goals are, I always tell kids that I know the diabetes can be frustrating and, and, and tough, but, um, but that it can't hold you back from accomplishing what you want to accomplish. And, and I also want to tell kids that I go through tough times as well. Like I know that this isn't always easy and, and my road to getting where, where, you know, getting to, to playing professionally, um, there were a lot of ups and downs and a lot of that was with, with dealing with, with diabetes. So I know that during those downs, it can be frustrating, but, I let them know that I went through the same thing and just to keep working hard and, and keep pushing forward because, um, you know, things will get easier and, and it can't, can't stop you from getting to where you want to go. Absolutely. I, I, I'll second that. Um, and thank you very much, Rich. Back over to you. Thank you, Olivia, Molly. Um, and, and maybe switching back a little bit, but in the similar vein, um, Jordan. Um, so you've set up a, a foundation. Um, and it, it sounds like a fascinating initiative. And I'm wondering if you might be able to educate us a little bit about what its aims are um, and what its hopes are, and maybe some of the successes with this foundation. Yeah, so when I came back from, from college and, and started playing professionally, my family and I knew we kind of wanted to set up a, a foundation because growing up as a kid, you know, I had different athletes that I maybe looked to that, that were diabetics that were playing professional sports and, and they were huge sources of inspiration for me. So I was like, if they could do it, you know, I, I, I can definitely do it as well, but I was never able to speak with them or, or hear their story or, or ask them questions. And so I was like, I want to hopefully be that resource for kids um, growing up with, with type one. And, and, you know, we're a small foundation. We don't have the resources to raise a lot of money for, for, you know, um, for, uh, looking for a cure or research for, for things like that. And so our main goal is what we say is to educate, inspire and support kids living with, with type one diabetes. And just pretty much preaching that message that, that I gave to the question before that um, 
diabetes can't hold you back from getting to where, where you want to go. And, and we, we do some pretty cool events where uh, we do a big soccer camp every, every summer. We have it coming up in August um, where we have diabetics come out and just do a fun day of, of soccer. And, and I think um, one of my favorite events, which with COVID we had to stop last year, um, but after every Sounders home game, and actually we started to do away games too. We'd bring a family um, and a, and a kid with type one on the field after the game. And I was able to talk to them and, let them have a fun little experience. So it's just, I mean, those, those meeting with kids are, are inspirational for me as well. And it's been, it's been awesome. It's, it sounds fantastic. And, uh, you know, we've uh, sneakily checked out your foundation webpage and the amount of children that attend these camps are fantastic to see. Um, and I guess, you know, would you agree that, you know, a child who's recently been diagnosed with type one diabetes stands uh, to, to gain from such confidence that's out there today that you can manage your diabetes quite successfully and carry on almost a normal life in the way that, uh, that, that people who don't have the condition can do so as well. Yeah, for sure. I think that's so important to understand at a young age. And I think that's part of these events is, is just preaching that idea. And it was so cool for me at our first camp. I remember this really vividly. We had a water break. Um, and when I was a kid at the water break, I was the only one that would go over and have to, you know, prick my finger. None of my teammates had type one, but at this water break, a hundred to 120 kids all went over to the sideline and were checking their blood sugar. And, um, it was pretty, pretty cool to see that just group together. And I think for these kids to, to be together in that sense and to, to see, oh, there's other kids dealing with this and, and, and thriving and doing well, it's just so important. Like I said, to, to be able to talk to, to people that are dealing with it uh, as well. So I think that's just a cool, cool opportunity for these kids. It certainly does sound like a fantastic initiative. We wish you the best with it uh, for its, it, its continuation. Um, but of course, you're a passionate professional yourself and uh, we're fingers crossed for your um, full recovery on your ACL injury. And we're wondering what your goals are uh, for the next few years in professional football. How would you like to keep challenging yourself yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, it's 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 difficult right now. The only kind of thing I'm focusing on is getting back on the field. Um, you know, my one job right now is is recovering and um, and uh, getting my getting my knee better. So that's that's the main focus. I would say that a, a huge goal of mine, and it always has been, is to play in the World Cup, um, which is obviously coming up next year. And, and so. Um, I think throughout this recovery, uh, my, my big focus is trying to trying to get better and 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 hopefully you know be a part of the, be a part of that team and, and uh, that's been a, my main goal since I was growing up as a kid watching the, the U.S. play um, at the World Cups in the past and, and to to be a part of something like that would be amazing. So I think that's uh, definitely a main goal of mine. We certainly wish you the best on that uh, the achievement of that goal for sure. Okay, we are rapidly running out of time, uh, but it's time for a, a, a slight deviation uh, over to a rapid fire fun Q&A uh, with Jason and Molly on almost one word answers, just to get a little flavor of uh, your, your mindset at the moment and a few other things that maybe aren't directly related to either football or diabetes. Over to you guys. Perfect. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, we're going to fire off some rapid fire questions at you, Jordan. So, uh, but part of these will be based on the Q&A questions that we've had through. So we've sort of all integrated it in. I'll just take the opportunity to thank everyone who has uh, been involved in the Q&A and, and given your questions for Jordan. And thank you, Jordan, as well, obviously. We'll start off. What is exactly your favorite pre-meal snack? Uh, like before a game or like... Yeah, but right before a game or as soon um, as before a game. Pasta. Great shout. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Next one. So how have you been keeping up with the Euros and who do you think is going to win? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Put you right on the spot. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to say Italy. Oh, okay. controversial. Yeah. controversial. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Do you have any pets? Uh, and are you a dog or a cat person? Yeah, I have a dog uh, with my wife and um, definitely a dog person. Yeah. What do you enjoy doing in your spare time kind of outside of football? Um, man, 
I'm, I, I like to play, I play video games. I play, uh, I think that's pretty, pretty fun um, with my teammates and some of my friends. So, yeah. I think I just heard all the kids who are listening into this, like their eyes <laughs> lit up as soon as you said that. Yeah, that might, might not have been good for the parents. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, another slight controversial one. Hopefully they're not listening in. Which player do you get along with the most that you play with? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get some, some stick for this one. Um, I have a buddy, Christian Roald on the Sounders that, that I'm really close with. So, um, yeah. Yeah, if they're listening, I'm going to get some some stick from some of <laughs> my other buddies. So, hopefully they're not. <laughs> Our lips are sealed. Our lips are sealed. Okay, next one. So, if you didn't play football, what sport do you reckon you'd play? I would love to play basketball. I think that'd be really fun. Uh, I think I'm a little bit maybe too short, but I, I would love to play. Yeah. Uh, if you've had a chance to see them, what do you make of the new Sounders kit in 2022 season and the new Swansea City badge, if, you, if, you, if you've seen it? Yeah, no, I saw it yesterday. It looks great. Um, I'm, I, I think both of them are, are awesome and um, represent some, some really cool things. So I'm excited to, well, the Sounders have worn theirs, but I'm si excited to see you both in action. And uh, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. And then next one, so what kind of music are you into? Do you have kind of like a pre-match playlist that you go to? Yeah, pre-match, I would say Drake is kind of my go-to. Um, pump me up a little bit. Um, yeah, I would say that was kind of, he's kind of my go-to artist. Nice. I think a lot, lots yeah. of people's go-to artists. Yeah. Drake. yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, are you in touch with any other athletes outside of football um, that also have type one or other areas um a little bit i think the 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 main one that i'm in touch with he actually played in seattle um andy rose he plays in vancouver uh now for the white caps a team in, in mls um but i actually knew him uh growing up and he was diagnosed with type one a little bit later on in his life um i think around 26 27 so um he reached out to me when he was diagnosed and we've we've definitely formed a, a great relationship and um you know talk through things a lot so i think he's the one i'm in touch with the the most yeah diagnosed a lot a lot later as well it must be an interesting yeah. difference of experiences definitely yeah so it, it was it was good to be able to talk with him yeah okay and last question a bit of a tough one here but what is your favorite movie oh man <laughs> um I love like comedy movies, so this is always my go-to answer. But I love Step Brothers. I'm a big Will Ferrell fan, and I think he's just hilarious. So um, movies like that, but that's a great one. Yeah, nice. Okay, I think yeah. that's then. So we'll hand back over to Richard now. Thank you very much, Jordan. Thanks, Jordan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I'm lost that Drake. It's way beyond my uh, genre. I think uh, it's <laughs> understanding musical tastes these days. Listen, Jordan. Uh, we're running out of time and I think we're, we just uh, have time to say thank you so much for giving up your time uh, and revealing openly the challenges of having type 1 diabetes, but also the rewards if you spend the time uh, engaging with your diabetes to try and work on successful solutions around exercise. It, you, you're a, a great example of how it can be done, um, albeit it does take uh, effort, um, but it is there to be had. And our parting piece of advice, I think, for people tuning in tonight is if you are interested in engaging more with exercise or intensifying your exercise, um, to, to reach out for resources such as the diabetes charities, um, you know, also to try to uh, have that dialogue with your healthcare professionals to make sure that, you know, they're aware of the uh, ambition that you have as a, a person with, um, with type one diabetes. And there are lots of resources out there, which I think more than ever before, they are online, accessible, and there to be had in terms of interpreting solutions for different people and their diabetes. Um, it just takes me to say a couple of final points. Uh, one is to give a mention to your foundation, the Jordan Morris Foundation, 
more information can be found at jordanmorrisfoundation.com. Um, and also for the, we have a broad range of people tuning in from very many different countries like Canada, Argentina, US and Europe. Um, to reach out for the, the national governing bodies as charities and uh, diabetes organizations for more help. Um, finally, one point to mention about um, our interest in, in research. Uh, we don't have all the answers in research terms for diabetes and exercise, but we certainly are still trying and lobbying to, to get the grant funding to help us to continue. And if you need more information on research around type one diabetes and exercise, do feel free to reach out to me um, and we can have more of a chat. Um, I'd like to say on behalf of Olivia, uh, Molly, um, Jason and myself from all of the background colleagues of Swansea City FC for allowing us to host it in your old club, um, Jordan, and uh, Swansea University for allowing us to, um, to, to really put together the background organization of this. A sincere thanks for your time. And we wish you and everybody tuning in today uh, a great day. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. That was awesome. Okay, guys. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. See ya.